Chapter Eleven of Paul the Dauntless. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Leeson. Paul the Dauntless by Basil Joseph Matthews. Chapter Eleven. The Call Abroad. In the cool dark room of a house in Antioch, after the work of the day, Barnabas and Saul and some friends gathered for their evening meal. Tired as they were, they felt the glow that comes at the end of a day filled, in each strenuous minute, with work on a task for which they greatly care. But one thing was lacking. If only Jesus could be there to say of the day's work, Well done, comrades! Peter and the others had told Barnabas at Jerusalem that, on the very last day before Jesus was crucified, he had supper with his friends. At the supper he broke bread and poured out wine from the cup and said, Do this in remembrance of me. And then, as he saw their crestfallen looks at the thought of his leaving them, he tried to cheer them. The world will see me no more, but you will see me, he said. So in Antioch at their supper, Barnabas and Saul and the others broke the thin loaves, handed the pieces of bread to one another, and passed the cup from hand to hand round the table in remembrance of Jesus Christ. As they did this and spoke of him, they knew that he was really there in the fellowship with them, nearer to them than breathing, closer than hands and feet. If any one of them broke out into anger with another one in the heat and rush of the day's work, he made it up at the supper, and they were friends again. They remembered, too, that many others of their friends in distant places were, at that same hour, breaking the bread and drinking the cup at the common table. Some of their comrades were at Jerusalem, and many in the little white villages in the country. Some sat down to supper after washing the stain of the fishing nets from their hands at the side of the Lake of Galilee, while others had gone home from working on ships in the thronged harbor of Sidon, or from the purple dyeing sheds at Tyre. There were more fellow Christians across the sea, trudging home from the fig orchards on the lovely island of Cyprus, and others from tending the goats on the hills behind Tarsus. So Saul and Barnabas and the others at their supper in Antioch asked God for good to come to all these brethren wherever they were. The words in which they prayed were something like this. As this broken bread was scattered as corn upon the mountains, and gathered together became one, so let thy church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into thy religion, for thine is the glory and power, through Jesus Christ for ever. One day a number of the brethren came to Antioch all tired and dusty. They had traveled all the way up through Palestine and Syria to Antioch. Among them was a man named Agabus, who had the gift of telling the future. There is going to be a great famine, he said to the others. Our brothers in Judea will be starving. What was to be done? They could not stand by in Antioch and see their friends die of hunger. We must save up a fund of money so that we can buy food for them when the famine comes. So the disciples put aside money from their income, each giving as he was able to afford. The money was to go to Jews, but the Greek disciples in Antioch as well as the Jews would give their money, for since they became disciples of Christ the great barrier was broken down between Jew and Greek. When enough money had been collected, it was handed over to Barnabas and Saul. The young Greek Titus was also sent to help them. A Greek Christian going along with the two Jews would help to show the Jewish disciples at Jerusalem what they had not yet realized, that it was not necessary to be a Jew in order to become a Christian. They spent the money in corn, and perhaps figs from Cyprus and dates, and then started out with their precious burden. They might row down the Orontes or ride along the road as far as Seleucia Harbor, and then, taking ship, sail down the coast to the harbor at Caesarea. As Saul came at last in sight of Jerusalem, it must have seemed strange to be coming back after nine years into the city from which he had been obliged to flee for his life. Nine years ago, he remembered, even the disciples at Jerusalem had shunned him, because they thought that their old persecutor was only pretending to be a friend. Now he was coming again to these very people who had been afraid of him, and was bringing with him food that meant life to them and their boys and girls. 
it sickened saul however in jerusalem to find that with all his training as a jewish scholar under that great master gamaliel he could not get his brother jews who were not christians even to listen to him indeed the fact that he had been the rising hope of the pharisees only made them more furious listen to a turncoat traitor with his pretended visions talking his everlasting blasphemies about jesus hear him declaring that he gloried in the accursed cross no they spat with disgust and anger it was in the lovely courts of the temple itself that saul would feel most of all that he was against a stone wall to walk where he had once studied and to see there groups of young students whispering to one another as they glanced at him with sneering looks to be an outsider in the cloisters of his own old college that cut to his heart indeed in the temple court saul looked up to the sky above and prayed in that hour there came to him as clearly as that other vision of jesus had come years before a vision and a voice and the voice said i have called you to leave the jews and go as my missionary to the peoples in jerusalem saul may well have stayed at the house of a relative of barnabas named mark whose son john was eager to go out from jerusalem into the wider world so when they had finished their work of taking food to the famine-stricken people young john started out with barnabas and saul on the journey back north to antioch john mark was in all likelihood like his uncle barnabas a native of cyprus as they tramped their way northward saul and barnabas would talk over that trance vision which saul had had in the temple the voice had said i have called you to go as my missionary to the peoples to leave his own people to go to others where would it all lead saul and barnabas would dream great dreams together as they talked but none of their visions of the future was to be so wonderful as the great adventures they were really to meet at last they were back once more within the walls of the heathen queen city and were soon telling simeon manaean lucius and the others in antioch all the news of jerusalem saul told them of the voice that said he was to go to the other nations as they talked together and then waited in silence the spirit within led them all to see that they must send some of their number right away to the far-off countries to spread the good news they were not to keep their best men at home they the brethren of the despised sect of the nazarenes were sending out the first missionaries to face the two greatest and most wonderful things the world had ever seen the religion of the hebrew people and the power and organization of the roman empire the work abroad called for the finest brain the best scholarship the ripest experience barnabas the trusted leader and saul the fiery swift-tongued university graduate must go from them they all met together and prayed and then the christian folk laid their hands on barnabas and saul this showed that the missionaries were going out as their men saul as he lay down on his bed on the floor that night knew that he was in the morning to start on a new adventure he did not know that the next day's tramp would be the beginning of long marches in which he would hunger and thirst and would be stripped and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with his own hands he was at the beginning of many journeys over seas and mountains wide weary plains and crowded cities wanderings that would never cease until they ended forever end of chapter 11